so in today's video we want to continue to look at um, graphs of sine and cosine or well, return to looking at graphs of sine and cosine we introduced the initial shapes early on we've talked about how dilations might change the period and amplitude and to a small extent also um, obviously reflections um, in the x and y axes and the impact of them um, we took a pause to solve some trig, trig equations and now we're coming back to sketching graphs as we add in the translations. Um, so when we are only adjusting the period and amplitude, there shouldn't be any need to solve an equation to find the x-intercepts because you should be able to use what you know about the x-intercepts before the dilation and then um, what that means for the x-intercepts after the dilation without needing the process of solving the equation. Um, similarly, actually, if we are only doing a horizontal translation, we also should not need to solve any equations in order to find the x-intercepts. Okay, If we plan the graph properly, um, then we should be able to um, simply just mark the x-intercepts on just purely by counting in fractions. Um, the only time we're going to need to solve an equation to find um, the location of any x-intercepts will be if we have translated the graph up or down um, and not even in all of those situations, so only in some. So we'll talk about that in the next video. Here again I want to stress the importance of good planning and preparation for these graphs. In the long run it will save you time. As I said, you, you plan and prepare properly and you won't need to solve an equation to find your x-intercepts. Okay, so let's just recall what it looks like in an equation when we are translating left and right. So if we were to write down the equation for the graph of y equals sine of x after translation pi on 4 units to the left. Okay, so if we remember how our translations to the left and right work, um, that will be when we're adding or subtracting inside the sine function. And we know that they appear somewhat backwards to what they... Um, what you feel like they should. So if you're translating to the left, it's because we're adding something on in to x inside the function, um, which seems a little counterintuitive, but if you return back to all our theory around transformations earlier in the year, um, you'll have some understanding of why that happens. Okay, so sine of x plus pi on 4 would be sine of x translated to the left by pi on 4. Okay, so adding that into our um, transformations, so we've already talked about A having an effect on the amplitude. Um, and obviously also if A was negative, our graph would be reflected in the x-axis. So if it's a sine graph reflected in the x-axis, that means it will go down before it then goes up. If it's a cosine graph reflected in the x-axis, that means it will start at the bottom and then go up and come back down. Okay. Um, if our n we know affects the period, sorry, so that's the di dilation by 1 over n from the y-axis, so that's going to affect the period, which will become 2 pi on n. Also, if n is negative, the graph is reflected in the y-axis. Now, these are interesting. We didn't actually talk properly about this previously. So the original, the normal sine graph, um, you know, goes up first as we go from left to right, um, from the origin, I should say. So if we reflect that graph in the y-axis, it's now going to go this way, which means if we continue that, it's actually the same as having reflected it in the x-axis. So we won't see that very often, we'll just see the negative out the front instead. The cosine graph, we know looks like this. If we reflect that in the y-axis, we're going to get this happening over here, which is actually just the same thing. So we're not really going to see negatives happening inside there very often. In the case of sine, we can create that graph shape by reflecting in the x-axis instead. And in the case of cosine, it doesn't do anything to reflect it in the y-axis. But for completeness. Um, and then the third thing uh, we're going to add in today is the translations to the left and right. So adding or subtracting onto x. Now I want to be clear about how we're going to differentiate or how we're going to be clear about the order of what's happening here. So we need to see what's happening inside the function as factorized, okay, in order to correctly identify the translation. Otherwise we have to do the translation before we do the period change and that's more complicated. For example, what I'm talking about here is, let's say I gave you the equation sine of 2x plus pi on 2. Okay, the period is 2 pi on 2, so the period is pi. That's fine. But the translation is not to the left by pi on 2 because I've got the period interfering with that. 
If I want to talk about a correct sequence of transformations, I could say this graph is translated to the left by pi on 2, and then it's dilated by half from the y-axis. So only after that translation is it dilated. That's much more confusing to draw, so we or to, to think through in the process of sketching the graph. And so what we always want to do is write it in the form that we see here, which is to factorise out that dilation factor if it isn't already factored out. Okay, so actually what we're seeing here dilation of half from the y-axis, so that makes the period pi, and then a translation to the left by pi on 4. So it's really important that we think that through a bit carefully um, when we are sketching our graphs. Okay, so we've got our three transformations, well technically um, four if we think about the reflections, but um, three values which could affect transformations. So let's sketch some graph. We're going to have a, go and have a look at four examples here. So the first one is to sketch the graph of y equals 3 times sine of x plus pi on 3. Okay, so what are we seeing here? We've got that 3 out the front, that's affecting the amplitude. We know the amplitude is going to be 3. That's the easiest thing to deal with in the sketching of the graph. We know the period is unchanged here, so the period is going to remain as 2 pi. And we know that this plus pi on 3 is a translation to the left by pi on 3. Okay, so if you recall the last um, video on graphing, um, it's really important to be able to divide your period into four equal sections. Okay, so that means we need to be able to think in terms of pi on two to be able to deal with the period so that we can mark those five key points that enable us to draw the graph. Okay, um, so pi on two is an important um, unit in terms of scaling the x-axis to be able to get the shape right. Now, we also want to move the graph to the left by pi on 3. So we're actually also going to need to be able to deal in units of pi on 3. So together here, if I need to be able to deal with both pi on 2 for the period and pi on 3 for the translation, then it makes sense for me to scale in multiples of pi on 6, the lowest common multiple of pi on 2 and pi on 3. If I scale in units of pi on 6, then I should be able to divide my axis in terms of in thirds of pi and also in terms of halves of pi. Okay? So that's the thing you need to really think through. This is the planning step that's important that then will make everything easier later. So we want to scale our axis in units of pi on 6. Okay. The other thing is it is helpful to be able to see that um, negative pi on 3 where the period of the graph would have started if we hadn't had this translation. Sorry, where it will start. Um, the beginning of the sine curve will start. Um, so we won't actually draw the graph back there, but it's helpful to have that um, to help you get your shape right. Okay, so let's think about what we've got going here. So we haven't gone up or down, so it's going to be symmetric about the x-axis still, so I'll put that in the middle. We want to draw the graph from 0 to 2 pi. Right, so I'm going to split my 2 pi into pi and I've already thought about the fact I need to use units of pi on 6. Now I'm not going to number every single point on my um, scale, okay? particularly not until I actually draw the graph on and see which ones are important, but I'm dividing my axis into pi on 6. So I've just taken pi, 0 to pi, and I've split that in half so that's now pi on 2. And I then want to split each of those regions, apologies, into 3 so that each of these will be pi on 6. Now again, if you're not able to do this vaguely accurate by eye, accurately by eye, by all means get a ruler. Okay, But essentially, we want to be able to divide our axis into units of pi on 6. Now I'm also going to go back here a couple of units, so this negative pi on 3, so I can see, as I said, where my sine curve would have started. We're not interested in it, and we won't draw it, but it helps us to get the shape right in terms of where the y-intercept should be. Okay, we haven't gone up or down at all, so we know our sine curve is going to start by going up, which is, sorry, we haven't reflected at all, so we're going to go up first. Then I want to think about those five key points. Now I'm going to mark those five key points, I'll use a, a different colour here so we can see what's happening, as if we hadn't done the translation. Okay, so if we hadn't done the translation, my sine curve would start here at zero, it would finish at the end of the period, which would have been at 2 pi, it would also cross the x-axis halfway along the period, which is pi. It would have a maximum value um, halfway between those first two x-intercepts, which is at pi on 2, and it would have a minimum 
value halfway between those second two x-intercepts, which would be at 3 pi and 2. Okay, so that would be where the graph would be. I strongly encourage you, every time you draw a graph translating left and right, to mark out those five key points before the translation. Then think about translating each of those five key points. Okay, so now we're translating to the left by pi on 3. So pi on 3, sorry, pi on 3 is this distance, two of these little ticks. Remember we've scaled our axis, so each of those ticks represents pi on 6, so pi on 3 is two of those. Okay, so we want to take each of these points and think about moving them to the left by that distance. Okay, and now we're seeing one complete period. Now, we're not interested in this part of the graph here, okay, but it helps us to think about our shape and where the y-intercept would be. Okay, so then if that doesn't quite take us to the end of the period, we can continue, we can just continue the graph. Now the important thing is, is our graph has a period of 2 pi and we are drawing the graph from 0 to 2 pi. So we are seeing one complete period of this graph. So that means that if my y-intercept is here, and we'll calculate that value in a minute, then at the end of the period, 2 pi away, I should be at that same height. Okay, so it's really important that you get that right, okay? Your graph, we're seeing one full period here, your graph shouldn't start and finish at different heights. Okay, So continuing my graph up to here, and again, thinking a bit about the curvature, we are heading towards another turning point, which would be here. Okay, So starting to curve your, your graph back. Sorry, that was a bit small if you couldn't see that. Your next turning point would be around about there. So it's important that you are thinking about that um, scale. Okay, so we've got our... Um, y-intercept to calculate and our x-intercepts to mark and our turning points to mark. I'm just going to get rid of that arrow there, it's confusing the graph shape. Okay, so our x-intercepts are easy now because it is just about counting. This is 1 pi on 6, this is 2 pi on 6, this is 3 pi on 6, the x-intercept therefore is at 4 pi on 6, which is 2 pi on 3. That turning point is at 1 pi on 6. Now remember our um, amplitude is 3, so the maximum height will be 3. Okay, we were at 4 pi and 6 here. 5 pi and 6, seven, uh, 6 pi and 6, 7 pi and 6 is this minimum. Negative 3. 8 pi and 6, 9 pi and 6, 10 pi and 6. So that's 5 pi on 3, 0. 11 pi and 6, 12 pi and 6. So this point is going to be at 2 pi. And then we just need to work out the y-intercept, and that will be the y-coordinate of the end point as well. Okay. Oh, sorry. Accidentally deleted my y-axis. Okay, so let's just calculate our y-intercept. Do that over on the side. Like any other function, y-intercepts we find by letting x equal 0. So y equals 3 times sine of pi on 3. So we need our exact values to work out what sine of pi on 3 is. Okay. Pi on 3 is 60 degrees, okay, this is half the equilateral triangle. Sine of pi on 3, opposite over hypotenuse, so it's root 3 on 2. So this is 3 times root 3 on 2, and so the y-intercept is 3 root 3 on 2. So my y-intercept is at 0, 3 root 3 on 2. My endpoint is at 2 pi, uh, sorry, 3 root 3 on 2. Intercepts, turning points, endpoints, domain is correct, everything is covered. We didn't need to solve any equations. All we needed to do was a little bit of work to find the y-intercept. Everything else is about the planning. Okay, let's have a look at number two. Sketch this graph here. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to observe here is the structure of what's happening in here. It's not correctly enabling me to identify the translation. So let's factor out that two. So this is cos of 2 times x minus pi on 4. Okay, so now we have a cos graph, no reflection. So the shape is going to start up and finish up. Okay, we've got a period change. The period is now 2 pi on 2, so pi. Our amplitude is unchanged, so amplitude is 1. 
and then we've got a translation uh, to the right by pi on 4. Okay, so thinking about the scaling of our axes. Okay, so the period is pi, which means a quarter of pi, pi on 4, is important for my, being able to mark those five key points that define the curve shape. Equally, we're translating to the right by pi on 4. Okay, so that information combined means that our scale of pi on 4 is going to work for us in this instance. Okay, we want to draw it over a domain from negative pi to pi, so let's draw suitable axes for that. Sorry, put that x-axis in the middle. Okay, so we want to go from negative pi to pi. And we've already talked about that we're going to need to divide our axis into units of pi on 4 in order to both represent the translation and also the graph shape itself. Now we're looking at a window here of a domain that spans 2 pi and so therefore we should expect to see two complete um, cosine curves here. Alright, again, the next thing I would do is think about marking out one period, the five key points that define one period without the translation. Okay, so the cos graph would be, would have been, just use a grey pencil here, would have been um, maximum value on the y-axis, maximum value at the end of the period, minimum value halfway along the period, and x-intercepts between each of those maximum and minimum values. So that would have been our cos curve. So we now want to look at taking each of those points and translating them to the left, or sorry, to the right, my apologies, to the right by pi on 4. So we want to move this whole graph to the right by pi on 4. Okay, so we're going to be looking at maximum value here, x-intercept here, minimum value here, x-intercept here. Okay, and yes, there'll be a, there would have been a maximum out here, but we've now lost that. So now we should be able to, I'm just going to get rid of those, oh, sorry. I'm just going to get rid of those arrows if I can. Um, now we want to uh, think about continuing the pattern. So what we're seeing here is something important happens every pi on 4. Okay, so I'm just going to continue to follow the pattern and work my way backwards. So here at pi, we've got an x-intercept. Pi on 4 before that, we've got a minimum. Pi on 4 before that, we've got an x-intercept. Pi on 4 before that, we've got a maximum. Pi on 4 before that, we'll be back at an x-intercept. Pi on 4 before that, we'll be back at the minimum. Back to the x-intercept, back to the maximum, and back to the x-intercept. Okay, so we just, we get the pattern right for the first period, and then we just follow the pattern. Okay, joining the dots. And whilst this is a cos function, because of the translation, it ends up looking a bit more like a sine function. But remember, they're the same curve. It's a sinusoidal wave. They're always only a translation away from being a sine function or a cos function. Okay, let's mark our key points. Intercepts, pi 0. This will therefore be pi on 2 0. 0 0. Don't really need to label. Minus pi on 2 0. And minus pi 0. Um, maximum and minimum values. Again, it's just about counting. Each of our ticks on our axis represents pi on 4. So this first one is at pi on 4. Amplitude was 1. So that's 1. 2 pi on 4. 3 pi on 4 is this minimum. Uh, this is negative pi on 4, negative 1. And negative 3 pi on 4, positive 1. Okay, and there is our graph. Okay, example three, sketching y equals negative cos of pi times x plus one. Okay, so again, a bit going on here. So we've got reflected cos reflected in the x-axis. Okay, so that means the shape's going to start at the bottom and go up. Okay, so thinking that through. We've got um, period change there. It's going to be, well actually I'll write to my amplitude first because that's unchanged. So my amplitude is still going to be 1 here. My period is going to be 2 pi on pi. So my period is going to be 2 
um, which is why now the domain makes sense. We want to draw this graph from negative 2 to 2. The um, x scale actually has nothing to do with pi anymore because we've got pi happening in that um, y dilation, and the dilation factor from the y-axis. Um, and then we go to the left by 1. Okay, so with a period of 2, we're going to need to be able to divide that into four equal sections, which means we'll need to be able to scale in units of a half, and that will also work with our translation to the left by 1. So I'm going to scale my axis in halves, and we're drawing this graph from negative 2 to positive 2. Okay, so again, let's go with negative 2, so that's negative 1, positive 1, and positive 2. Um, let's split each of those in half, and then we've got our axis scaled in the required unit. So it's minus 2 and 2, and so therefore each of these is half. Again, we're seeing a domain that spans um, a, a, a range of 4, and so our period is 2, and therefore we're going to see two complete cosine curves. Okay, so again, let's mark out the points of the first period without the translation. Okay, so we it's upside down, so it's going to start at the bottom, okay, negative 1. It's going to finish at the end of the period without the translation um, at the bottom again. Halfway along the period, it'll be at the maximum value. And then halfway between each of those is we'll cross the x-axis. So I don't think I made my maximum quite as high as my minimum. Alright, so that's the period without the translation. We then want to take each of those points and translate them to the left by 1. Okay, so left by 1, remember our um, axis is scaled in units of half, so left by 1 is this far. Okay, so we want to move each of our points to the left by 1, to the left by 1, and uh, to the left by 1, and then to the left by 1. Okay, so we've now got one cos curve um, correct, and now we just continue to follow the pattern. So again, each time we move across by a half, we get to the next key point. So we're at the minimum here at x equals 1, back to the x-intercept at 1.5, and, and then up to the maximum at 2. And following the pattern out to the left, minimum, back up to the centre, and then up to the maximum here. Okay, and then we can join... Our points. Now again, remember. Notice when you start. Remember, this is a, this is a turning point here at the end point. So it's really important that when you draw this graph, it doesn't just go straight into that point. Okay, it's actually a turning point there. So make sure that your graph shape shows that. Okay. Again, key points. 2, uh, amplitude was 1, so it's 2, 1, 0, 1, negative 2, 1. Halfway here, that's 1, negative 1, negative 1, negative 1. And then again, each tick on your axis represents a half. So this is half 0, this is 3 on 2, 0. And you can just count 1 on 2, 2 on 2, 3 on 2, 4 on 2, etc. Negative 1 on 2, negative 2 on 2, negative 3 on 2. All the intercepts marked, endpoints marked, and turning points marked. Okay, let's have a look at this fourth one. So y equals sine of one third times x minus pi on four. Okay, so let's think about what we're dealing with here. It's a sine graph with no um, reflections. So shape's going to go up first and then down. Uh, we've got amplitude unchanged. We have period. which is 2 pi divided by 1 third, so that is 2 pi times 3, which is 6 pi, which again makes the domain make sense. Uh, then we've also got a translation to the right by pi on 4. Okay, so again, thinking about scaling, these two things are important. Okay, so for this 6 pi on 4 or 3 pi on 2 is going to be an important scale and pi on 4 is also an important scale. Okay, so um, we can measure, we can break 3 pi on 2 up into units of pi on 4, we can break halves into quarters, so actually scaling using pi on 4 is going to work for both of those things.
Okay, so uh, let's draw our graph. Let's see what we've got. So our domain is 0 to 6 pi. Okay, so 6 pi, 3 pi, split that into thirds. So each of those is now pi. Okay, I might make those a bit bigger just so we can see those ones clearly. And then if I divide each of these into 4, so halve it and halve it again. Okay, so now we are seeing each tick on our x-axis represents a distance of pi on 4. I'm going to also go back a bit over here because I'm going to need to move to the left. Okay, so again, let's think about the sine curve ignoring the translation. Sorry, I'm going to the right, so I could have ignored that. My apologies. Um, ignoring the translation to the right, let's get the graph shape right. Okay, so our period is pi on 6, our amplitude is 1, our sine curve is not reflected. Okay, so without the translation, we would have started here at the origin at 6 pi, also been at the, at, um, on the x-axis, halfway along, so at 3 pi, we would have been also on the x-axis, and then halfway along from there, so that's at 1.5 or 3 pi and 2, we will be at the maximum, and halfway along from there, we will be at the minimum. Okay, so there's my five key points. I can't see them, I'll just mark them with crosses. Five key points that define the curve before the translation, and the translation is to the right by pi on 4. Okay, so I'm going to take each of those points and I'm going to move them to the right by pi on 4. Pi on 4, this point goes to the right, pi on 4, goes to the right by pi on 4, this point goes to the right by pi on 4, and this point's going to go off outside the domain, but I'm going to mark it just to help me draw um, so I can get a sense of what's happening there. So if we think about uh, drawing in our curve by joining the dots, maximum, back to the center, minimum, and then heading up towards that x-intercept, but we're going to be stopping here. I'm just going to get that 6 pi out of the way from there. We're going to be stopping here. Now, again, because we're seeing one complete period, I need to make sure that my endpoint and my y-intercept are at the same value. Okay. So there's our graph. So we're going to need to calculate that y-intercept. Let's do that. So for the y-intercept, which is also the y-coordinate of the endpoint, um, we're letting x equal 0. So that is y equals sine of uh, one third times pi on four. Oh, my apologies, I meant to fix this question. So this isn't an exact value, sine of pi on 12. Uh, you will, don't expect to get something that's not an exact value, but for now I'll just mark this point as sine of pi on 12. So I'll mark this point as zero sine of pi on 12. Um, but in a, you can expect that to be something that you actually have the information to work out. So this endpoint will be at, sorry, it's not two pi, is it at six pi? 6 pi, sine of pi on 12, and then we should be able to mark everything else. Our amplitude is 1. Okay, so again, this all becomes about counting. So each of the little, little ticks on our scale is pi on 4. So this x-intercept is at pi on 4, 0. Then this is 2 pi on 4, 3 pi on 4, 4 pi on 4, 5 pi on 4, 6 pi on 4, 7 pi on 4 is where this turning point is. Continuing on 8 pi on 4, 9 pi on 4, 10 pi on 4, 11 pi on 4, 12 pi on 4, 13 pi on 4. For this x intercept, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 pi on 4. For the turning point, uh, and then we haven't got any further x intercepts. So x intercepts, turning points, endpoints, all marked with coordinates. Okay. So it's all about the planning. In particular, thinking about how should I scale my axes given the period I'm dealing with. So you're interested in a quarter of the period because that helps you get the shape right. 
and then given the translation to the left or right. So you might need to think about a lowest common multiple in order to get a sensible scale so that you can deal with both the period. So that will help you to mark the intercepts and the turning points in the right places and also that you can then translate those points according to the translation. Okay, um, the other thing I just wanted to note before you get started here is that in your textbook sometimes the equations omit brackets that really should be there. So for example, it's if it says y equals sine 2 brackets x plus pi, actually there should really be brackets around here and it should really be written like this. So just some notational stuff. And um, if you're going to write it by hand, can you get used to putting those brackets in where they should be? sign brackets and then whatever's going inside there if there needs to be another set of brackets that's fine just write another set of brackets inside 